find where you can uniquely add value as a volunteer. There are so many different roles and there are so many different spaces. And so one example might be, um, not all actuaries are great at writing, but we have so many places where we need people to author articles. And so if you're one of those people, it's like, Hey, I love writing. I don't necessarily need it as much in my day job. You can write an article about something you're really passionate about. And that'll elevate the quality of the publications. Hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, so I'm very excited to hear about your career journey. So first to start off, can you please introduce yourself and provide us with maybe some insight into your background and experiences? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, V. Looking forward to this. Um, so I'm Amanda Hug. I work as a director at WTW on the life side. Um, Willis Towers Watson, many former names. Uh, I've been doing that for about two years. Prior to that, I was at Mass Mutual for a decade, um, where I did a lot of different roles, tried to move around as much as I could and get as many experiences as I can. So I worked in life, annuities, retirement, supplemental health, and worksite. Um, I did both pricing and valuation roles, and then also had um, a time where I was chief of staff to the CFO. Uh, I'm active in the industry. I'm currently serving as the um, on the SOA board of directors, which I'm enjoying. I'm in my third year. I have my MBA from University of Chicago Blue School of Business, and I'm also a committed Christian. So I happen to also have my Master's of Divinity um, from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. And um, I guess maybe a fun fact is I would say I'm not your traditional actuary as far as risk tolerance. Um, I do love to travel and I love to find adventures while I'm traveling. And so one of my recent uh, adventures was I went swimming at the top of Victoria Falls in Zambia. Um, and it is as scary as it sounds being at the top, but it was still a really fun experience. Um, yeah, so that's me. Wow. Wow. What an experience with that. I think my, I guess my most adventurous experience may be skydiving. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've done that too and love it. Where did you go? Uh, just uh, somewhere up north in Ontario in Canada. Yeah. Just okay. like one boring weekend, me and my friend just say, oh, just let's just do it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Why not? Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I would love to hear more about your current role, like which specialize in litigation support for insurance companies, analytics and transformations. Uh, so I want to know more about like maybe the challenges and opportunity that you encounter in this area, uh, particularly like maybe how you leverage data or predict like, analytics in the insurance industry. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, interestingly, I would say, you know, working on litigation support for insurance companies, analytics transformation, those are all not necessarily connected, but the data aspect certainly does bring them all together. Right. And so I would say actuaries have worked with data for many decades. We're very good at it. We are good data wranglers, but it's interesting because our relationship with data has certainly evolved. And I think companies are now thinking about data as a business asset. It's not just, you know, something you need. It's something that you can actually leverage and hopefully turn into revenue if you use it correctly and you build the right models and you know have the right programs in place. And so with that, some of the challenges that we see are... The first is just data availability and readiness, um, which sounds obvious, <laughs> like you need the data. Um, but it's actually one of the, the biggest challenges our clients are facing is they have these legacy blocks of business and their data is kind of snuck, stuck in different admin systems. And it's difficult to bring it all together. And it's difficult to have consistency and definitions and have the right people being able to access the right data at the right time. Um, and so I work on a lot of transformation projects where you're thinking about an end to end business process could be anything, but often it's like a financial reporting process, like reserving or cash flow testing. And, um, we're looking at the whole journey from inputting the data, running the models, getting the results, analyzing them and, and making recommendations and decisions. But that data is the first piece. And if that's not in a good state, it's really hard to do the rest. And so what we recommend is just strong partnership with IT, right? This is where actually can't operate in, in silos. We need to be collaborative with the other business uh, folks that we work with. And so IT often owns the data or at least owns the data platform that the data sits on. So just getting really clear with them about what your business requirements are for your data can help, can help a lot. 
Um, the other challenge I would say about data is the ethics of using it, actually. So there's so much data now that we have that we didn't have before. And so you have to stop and say, okay, let's just not dive in and use all of this. Is it really appropriate? And what do we have to consider? So um, Willis Towers Watson partnered with the SOA actually to build out one of their new certificates, which is called, I think, um, the ethical use of data and predictive analytics. And there's a lot of good stuff in there. So plug for that if you want to go and take that course. Um, but one of the things we talk about is making sure that there's fairness in your predictive models and you're not introducing bias. And so certainly you don't want to be building models that discriminate against protected classes of people, for example. Um, and so it's it's probably pretty obvious you're not going to put in a variable like race since that's a protected class. But you may want to also make sure that you're not using proxy variables that correspond or correlate to race. So for example, zip code might be one that you might want to make sure um, doesn't end up being a proxy for something like that. Um, so those are some of the challenges. Um, but I think it's an exciting time to have all of this data. And I mean, V, you know better than anyone with your, your master's in computer science and IT. Like, There's so much we can do with it. And so it's just on us to make sure we do it in the right way. Yeah, absolutely. Because like, I definitely also see the same challenges uh, that my company is currently facing. So I will have so much data. And as you say, the whole legacy block, have you migrated into one common platform? And then how you can actually understand the data, where it comes from, and then clean the data to making sure that it's accurate, uh, uh, high quality so that you can use it, right? Because I, I believe... Uh, Actually, somebody say it they, like garbage in garbage. Yeah, out. yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. true twenty years ago, and it's still true today, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, but yeah, it it also can open a lot of opportunities, and I think that's where the actuaries, uh, we we have expertise in using the data and turning it into informations and insights, right? So that's very exciting for the actual profession. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, your diverse like career journey, like encompass like uh, also the classical actual position, but also have a less typical role. Especially like I'm very interested in your prior role as a chief of staff. So yeah. So can you share with us like how you transition into that role, and then like maybe provide information on what is it really about and the responsibilities of the role. Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking. Um, so I pursued my career as an actuary because I thought that it was the perfect kind of foundation to a career in business leadership, right? You take your time to get that technical knowledge, really understand the business. And then I think you can, you can really go anywhere, I believe. Um, and so I'm glad that you say sort of less typical. I, I don't love the term like non-traditional because I think that separates us into like, you have traditional actuaries and non-traditional actuaries, but I would love to have the narrative that actuaries can do so many things and we don't need to be pigeonholed into to specific types of roles. And so that's kind of how I always viewed my career was, hey, I have flexibility. Let me spend some time. I spent eight years in traditional roles, um, you know, pricing, valuation, all the, that good stuff. And then that's when I went back and got my MBA at Chicago Booth. And so um, and at that time, the CFO asked me to be her chief of staff. So uh, for me, it was kind of natural. Like it just it all kind of culminated where I was like, I feel like I've done enough on this side and, and these different opportunities were opening up. Um, but I mean, chief of staff to the CFO, you're still in the finance division, you're still working with many actuaries, you're working with accountants. Um, so I consider it kind of like a soft pivot. I don't think it was that that dramatic of a role change. Um, and as far as what the role entailed, uh, every chief of staff role is different depending on who your leader is. Um, so certainly if you're looking for a chief of staff role, you know, talk to the leader about what it entails. But my experience was we were in the middle of a three-year finance transformation where we're really trying to upskill, change the way that we work, use more data and analytics, um, you know, outsource some of our some of our work. And um, so my role was kind of the, the co-management of her staff as it related to ex the execution on that strategy. So I would lead the development of our annual strategic goals. 
and then the monitoring of them throughout the year to make sure that we were kind of staying on track against what we had committed to do and holding people accountable to, you know, to, to what they had planned, making sure that good collaboration was happening and we weren't operating kind of in these silos of like controllers, tax, financial planning and analysis, but that we were thinking more holistically, which was another piece of the transformation journey. Um, so it was really fun. It was a lot of um, working with people, working with data, right? And making sure that we have data-driven decisions and we have data about how we're doing against our metrics. Um, I love that kind of stuff. And, and so that was really fun. And then the other piece that was maybe um, not your typical actual role was thinking about the culture of the organization. So we had about 300 people in the finance division. And some of them had been there for 25 years and had been kind of doing the same type of work for that amount of time. And so to have this um, big change thrust upon them is, is unsettling. Like we're humans, right? We tend to resist change, but we, we can adapt as long as we're brought along and understand the why. So that was a big piece of my role was communicating. Why are we doing this? Like, what are the things, the challenges that are facing our business that are requiring us to adapt? And then, you know, what is it? What's in it for me? What's in it for the employees? They're going to have a better experience because they're going to have better technology. They're going to be able to work on, you know, analytics instead of number crunching and do higher value added work. So when you tell that story, and that story you need to tell in kind of any change journey, um, I think that 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 helped. That helped um, with the cultural shift. And so hopefully, you know, I left I left them better off than uh, I came. But um, they're still, you know, that their official journey is over but they're still continuing to iterate and evolve and, and, and that's fun to see from afar. Great. Would you say that like by you studying the MBA, it was helping with this transition, this soft pivot that you mentioned? I think it was really helpful. Yeah. Because some of the classes I took, like behavioral economics, right? I took it with uh, Dick Thaler, who is a Nobel Prize winner, which was just like the coolest thing to be in his class. Um, and you learn things about like, how humans operate and we don't always operate rationally as much as like as actuaries we want to believe efficient market hypothesis and that's true in some regards but also people act irrationally and they act based on emotion and so just getting to have a class where you learn some of those things then i was able to take those techniques and apply them and then i think the other piece that was really helpful was just more of the the big picture financial um classes that you know i had done accounting in undergrad and stuff like that but it was the perfect time to do a refresher on accounting, a refresher on operations, a refresher on you know pricing and, and different pricing methods um, while I was in that finance division. So yeah, it worked out well. It doesn't always work out that well, but <laughs> it was good timing for me. Yeah. Actually, I think when I was taking my MBA, my company was also going through transformation. And then I was like seeing, trying to see like how uh, we are being taught in school and how it's actually being applied. So that was like interesting. Yeah. Like, too. yeah. Where'd you get your MBA? Uh, I got my MBA at IE Business School. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So yeah. So like uh, with your diverse experience, this, uh, so... Uh, I'm interested in understanding how all of the experiences and your knowledge and, and everything like shape your perspective and approach as an actuary. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's just reinforce the theory I had at the beginning of this career that actuaries can do so many things. Um, I really do believe that we are so well positioned. And I'm honestly not really an anomaly. I feel like my career path is kind of starting to be more of the norm where especially earlier in career actuaries are saying... I mean, look at you, like, here are the different things that I want to do and pursue. And I'm just going to kind of like accumulate all these degrees and it's all going to come together and help me. And so I love seeing other people do that um, as well. And so I'm certainly not, you know, alone in that. Um, I think... I'm really optimistic about the future of our profession. And uh, even though you know there's so many ch changes in technology and so many changes and things that um, are coming up, we have a skill of actual judgment that I think will always be important and always be relevant. Um, the SOA board recently had a discussion about artificial intelligence, which was really interesting and about how it will affect actuarial work. Um, and we did like a little temperature check. How are you feeling about AI and, and actuaries? Are you feeling really negative? 
negative? Are you feeling positive somewhere in the middle? And it was kind of cool to see the board. It was like very much a bell curve of people that are like, yeah, I'm not so sure about this. And then some people were really excited. And then, you know, of course, many people in the middle saying there's risks and opportunity kind of at the same time. I definitely fall more towards the positive. Um, I see artificial intelligence elevating the role of the actuary because we've all put things into chat GPT and gotten like completely wrong answers. And, you know, the, the, the software makes it sound like it's positive. It's the right answer. And so our role is going to be asking the right questions challenging, um, you know, thinking about, like you said, garbage in, garbage out. So what are those right inputs? And when we get the outputs, sanity check, does it make sense? Is it what we expected? If it's not, why not? You know, could there be a reason for it? And so I think we can continue to do that. We've always adapted well to different types of technology as they've come up. Um, so I think, I think we, uh, we have a great opportunity there. And, you know, going back to our discussion on data, we need to make sure there's a human that's not putting bias into those data or models because AI may not have that same kind of human component that we we do as real humans. Um, so I'm I'm very excited about the opportunities that we have. And yeah, I think my career path has has just reflected that optimism. Great. I'm with you on the positive <laughs> sentiment, especially with artificial intelligence and something, because yeah, I totally uh, agree on what you say is like, I believe is will elevate the profession because we're still going to go through all of this education, getting ourselves equipped, improving our critical thinking and stuff, right? That is where we know how to leverage these technologies so that we can do the job even better. And yeah, I, I also experienced a different scenario where like, yep, chat GPT, they say it like, this is so right. And you know, yes. no, no, that's not right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, so we are at the end of our interview. And I would say like, uh, I want to commend you for your commitment for volunteering with the actual professions, right? And especially you also currently running uh, for the president of the Society of Actuary as well. So uh, I want to hear more about like how the the engagement with on the actuarial lead, uh, uh, volunteering like help with your professional development and perhaps getting some advice on like for other actuaries who want to make a meaningful impact to our actual community. Absolutely. Um, okay, so this is my favorite topic, so I'll try not to talk for too long. Um, I would say volunteering has been one of, if not the most rewarding parts of my career journey. Um, and that's because you get to make a direct impact on the profession. And kind of the way that I think about it is you become, when you volunteer, you become a slice of history, right? There are these amazing leaders who have come before you that have built what we have today. You know that there are amazing leaders coming after you that are going to do even more, but you're just right there in this moment, contributing what you can. And I just think that that's so fun. Um, and so just to kind of give some examples. So I was president of two local actuarial clubs, um, one of which is the Actuaries Club of Hartford and Springfield. It's the largest club in the country. Um, and that was such a rich time because even though it's a big club, like at the end of the day, it's still just kind of a small planning committee, making decisions, putting on the meetings, and you're able to really enact change. And so for for example, when um, I was uh, president, we rebranded re the club with a new logo. They're still using it today. We built a mobile website, still using it today. We hired a professional photographer. They always have great professional photos at every meeting now. Um, and, and all of those changes, I think, hopefully led to um, growth in the club. And so that was when we crossed over 400 attendees at our meetings, which was such like a cool milestone. And some of the SOA meetings themselves have kind of numbers around that size. Um, and so those are really like tangible well, they seem small. It's like hiring a photographer, but those were tangible decisions that we made as a group that made the club better. And now the current leadership is doing phenomenal. They just launched a new sponsorship structure. Um, they're, they're having some paid speakers, which is elevating the quality of speakers. And so again, going back to that, like you're a slice of history and you get to see what comes after you, um, is really fun. And I think the other thing I love about volunteering is just the relationships that you build. Like a lot of times we talk about building your network. 
I, and it does. It builds your network. But I honestly think about like building friendships. Um, on the SOA board, we spend a lot of time together, like uh, three boarding meetings a year of like two full days. And so um, some of my best friends are in the, in the profession are the ones that I was on the am on the board with or was on the board with. Um, and that just makes makes the experience of being an actuary so much better because I have someone outside my company to bounce things off of, right? If I'm having challenges at work or I just like need a listening ear, um, they're there. And I just I put a really high value on that. Um, so I guess what I would say as far as advice is find where you can uniquely add value as a volunteer. There are so many different roles and there are so many different spaces. And so one example might be, um, not all actuaries are great at writing, but we have so many places where we need people to author articles. And so if you're one of those people, it's like, Hey, I love writing. I don't necessarily need it as much in my day job. You can write an article about something you're really passionate about. And that'll elevate the quality of the publications that the SOA or other actual organizations are putting out there. Um, another example is maybe you're an academic, maybe. You know, you you're one of those career changers and um, decided to to go become a professor. Well, the exam system we have. Um, oh, I don't have the numbers. We have four thousand volunteers in the SOA, and a good chunk of those are in the exam system. Maybe like fifteen hundred, if I were to guess. Um, and so those are people who are writing exams, grading exams, things that professors do on a day to day basis, and, and a regular actuary doesn't. And so that could be a great place for you to add your unique value. Um, and so that's kind of why I'm running um, for SOA president right now. I'm probably your uh, honestly less traditional candidate and that I'm earlier in career than most past presidents. Um, but I view that as a positive. Over half of our SOA members are millennials, myself included, I think VU included. Um, so the way I look at it is I represent a demographic that is very excited about what actuaries can do and has a long journey of career ahead of them. And so we need to make sure that the SOA stays relevant, right? We have these long careers and we want to, we want to evolve. We want to adapt. We want to um, take into consideration the advances in data science, the advances in AI, um, you know, the, the way our world is becoming more global. And I think because I'm kind of in this group, I have an, a unique perspective that maybe someone later in their career might not. And they bring something different that I don't, right? So, so no critique or criticism. Um, but that's why I'm kind of going for it. Um, I am very bought into the SOA strategy. I think we have a great strategy and we have a great mission. I helped write the strategy a couple of years ago um, as my board role. But my view is we just need to act with more boldness and more urgency. And um, so we can't be afraid of change. We can't be afraid of modernizing. And that is that is why I'm running and why I'm excited about the opportunity. Great. I like how you say like act with boldness and then don't be afraid to change right and i think that reflects in your career journey as well with like uh leading on of these transformations and then ultimately what pick up in it is that that is what leadership is about making positive change to the people around you to the work you do to the society and the community and and so on yeah absolutely yeah yeah so yeah Thanks again for like being here today and sharing all of these valuable insight and experiences. Yeah, I wish you all the best with the elections and, and everything. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. This was so fun. And I love that you do this. So thank you for what you're adding to our profession. 